Hello, everyone. Are you all back? Okay, so let's start. So now what do I mean by, uh, so let's do a quick revision before we went for a break. So we, in the first module, uh, studied about the fundamentals of cloud. Okay. Um, what is cloud, what is cloud types of, uh, types of cloud models, types of services available in cloud. Okay. And apart from that, we saw uh, what was services specific to the Azure cloud, that is the resource groups, the resources, what is subscription, what is management groups, and so on and so forth. Okay, then we moved on to module two, where we started with the compute services in Azure. Okay, well, wherein we talked about the um, virtual machine. We created one virtual machine. What is a virtual machine? I talked about what is a scale set, what is, uh, sorry, what is a availability set, what is an availability zone, okay? And we, uh, how you can make your virtual machine highly available, okay? Now coming to the scalability perspective, okay? If you want to scale your VM, okay? Let me give you an example like, if you recall in the morning, we talked about elasticity and all of that, correct? So elasticity and scalability are something that are go hand in hand. Okay, they are somewhat similar, but elasticity is something that you cannot, it's not in your hand fully, but scalability is something that is in your hand. Now, what do I mean by scalability here? It is how quickly or how fast can a resource you know, scale up or scale down. Okay. So now let's say I have a website and I have deployed an application on certain set of servers. Okay. So I'll just draw a image. I think that will be better. So let's say I have a website that I have created. Okay. And I just Okay. So let's say I have that website running on a VM. Okay. So let's say this is my VM1. Okay, and I have a website or an app. Deployed on this particular VM. Okay, so when we configure a VM, if you all recall, we did certain things, right? What are the things? Can you all put it in the chat box? Like what flexibility you had when we configured a VM? I did some uh, configurations regarding the uh, memory, re regarding the disk. Okay, so 
do you all recall did we do that in the morning yes so what did we do what else did we do apart from that Yes, what did I configure in the morning? Yes, size of what? Size of the disk, then. Yes, absolutely right. OS, disk, memory, correct? Image, correct? This is what I configured when I created a VM, right? So you now, now just consider these two things, the disk, Your memory, that is your memory. Size of the memory. How many V CPUs? Correct. This is just consider this in a VM. Okay. So let's let's say I've configured all these things for VM one. Okay. Now what is happening? my website now let's say my website is getting a lot of load on that or is getting a lot of load on that website which is deployed on vm1 OK, lots of people are coming in trying to use it. OK, and a lot of traffic because I'm only one VM is being diverted to this particular VM. OK, like 100% of my traffic is all being concentrated over here. So what will happen now since only one VM is there? Again, the same question comes into picture, right? That the customer that is coming in will face what will face latency will face downtime the application will not be up and running correct so in that situation if you want to make your vm highly available you can go for something called as vm scale sets now what does this mean as the term scale it means you can do the scalability. So in terms of scalability, what can you do? So let's say your traffic. On VM one. Goes above, let's say 70%. OK, what you can do, you can do two things over here. One is you can either scale up. which is also called as vertical scalability. Or you can scale across or down. Which is also called as horizontal. Scalability. So if the traffic on VN1 goes above 70%, what you can do, you can do two things. Either you increase the capacity, that is this capacity, the physical capacity of the VM, okay? Like you um, increase the memory, you increase number of v, uh, v CPUs or the computing or the processing units that are there. You increase the size of the uh, disk, okay, or memory. OK, you can add, let's say SSD or something you change. OK, the configuration or you add in things. OK, that means the same resource. You're giving it more power. You're giving it more capability to handle the traffic. So this kind of a scalability is called as vertical scalability or scaling up the same resource VM1. OK, when you increase the memory, the core processing power of that VN1, it is called as vertical scalability or scaling up. But let's say you don't want to do this. OK, let's say you don't want to increase the capacity of this VN1. Instead of, you know, uh, increasing the capacity, you tell us your OK, if. The traffic on.
if the traffic on VN1 is above 70 percent, you create another VM. Now, what do I mean by this? So if the capacity goes above 70 percent on this particular VM, OK, so whatever is the remaining like now it has reached 100 percent. So 30 percent, OK, will be diverted. OK, will be diverted or a new VM of the same configuration of VM1 will be created and your app will run on that. OK, so this is your VM. Another VM of the same configuration. OK, the same things. The size, same, memory, same, OS, same. OK, will be created and on this VM, whatever is the 30 percent of traffic. Will be managed. On this. VM. So what are you doing instead of? Increasing the capacity of VM1. What you're doing, you're putting another VM in place or you're creating one more VM, okay, of the same size, okay, and whatever is the 30%. So this has a capability of let's say 70%, okay, the 30% will be managed by the other VM. So this scalability is called as horizontal scaling or scaling down. OK, so this is how VM scale sets are created. OK, so if you or it is also called as scaling out, the scaling down process is also called. You can call it as scaling down. Uh, scaling out. And this is also called as scaling in. No, sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, scaling out and scaling in are different processes. I'll just explain that what it is. But this means scaling down and this means scaling up or horizontal scaling and vertical scaling. OK. Now, what do I mean by scaling in and scaling out? So let's say uh, the 30 percent of the load has been managed. OK, and um, now you no longer need this particular VM that you have created. OK, in horizontal, if you have set a rule, OK, so these are nothing but rules like traffic on VM1 more than 70 percent or so and so forth. These are nothing but rules that you have set. OK, if the power goes, I mean, if the traffic goes beyond this, then you have to do this. OK, so these are rules that you are setting or thresholds. OK, but let's say now these 30 percent is no longer there. The VM1 has come back to 70 percent, like the percentage of traffic has come down to 70 percent. OK, or is greater. Uh, yeah, it's come down to 70 percent. Let's say so. Do you, need, do you need this VM that has been created? Do you think you will need this VM? Yes, guys, will you need this other VM? That is there. No, right? You will no longer need. So if you have a rule set up, OK, that if the traffic has gone above 30 percent or is less than 70 percent, what you can do is then automatically this VM that is there. Will be removed from your Scale sets will be removed 
and only this VN will be functioning that you have created. So the moment I say scaling out, okay, so that means when I add another resource, that means scaling out. But when I don't no longer need that resource, I am scaling in and reducing the resources, okay, and I am coming back to the same original VM. So this is called as scaling in and scaling out. So when I say scaling in, sorry, I'll say scaling out first. So scaling out means when I increase the resource, okay, it can be up and down, depends. OK, if you have traffic, you can either increase up or down. OK, then. The other is scaling in, which means you decrease. The resource when you don't need. Now the traffic has gone beyond 30% or is less than 70%. OK, this VM can go away and all the load can be diverted to this particular VM. So this is if you have to configure these rules, these settings that is called as VM scale sets. So these are some of the ways in which you can make your VM highly available. OK, so this is how one way you can do it. Yeah, scaling down has all of these options of scaling in and scaling out. OK, I missed that part. I'm sorry. So scaling in and scaling out is what uh, you can also do with VM scale sets. So you have horizontal and vertical uh, scalability. OK, you can increase. So what is scale up? Scale up means you increase the load on that VM itself on this particular VM. OK, either you increase you increase the processing power either through adding more compute, uh, sorry, adding more processing units, adding more memory. You increase the capability of the same virtual machine so that it can handle traffic better or you add another resource. OK, you uh, scale out OK, uh, uh, using um, add by adding another VM OK of the same size. OK, so that if 70, if there is a 100 percent load on one VM, the 30 percent is managed by the other VM and 70 percent is managed by the first VM. So this is what is the VM scale sets in Azure. OK. Any questions, guys? So vertical scaling is uh, scaling the same resource, whereas horizontal is like you add another resource of the same uh, type. So that is what is basically horizontal and vertical scaling. It can also be scale up and scale out. Actually, not scale down, scale out. Sorry, I made a mistake over there. Yeah. Yeah, so this is what is VM scale sets. This is how you can even increase or manage your load in case uh, you are facing some problem with uh, high availability. Then this is availability sets. This is another way in which you can manage your VMs. OK, or in case you face fault tolerance or or you face some failure or there is some maintenance that is going on. OK, in uh, racks of those data centers. You can uh, go for this particular option. This is in your hand. Like I said, it's infrastructure as a service. So this is in your hand. You can manage. OK, scalability is something that will be in your hand, but elasticity will not be how much uh, servers will be required at the data center, how much space 
Okay, I'm talking about the physical space, not about the disk or uh, that you have created in the virtual machine, not about that, but how much physical space will be required at the data center and all of that will be taken care of by the cloud service provider. Rest, okay, how much VMs you need, how much compute power that VM will need with all into your hands. So this is what is uh, how you can make your VMs highly available to your users that are using if you have given them the rights. So we saw how to create a VM. OK, then the other service in Azure is the Azure Virtual Desktop. Now, what does Azure Virtual Desktop mean? So let's say you have a team of five members. OK, and uh, you uh, in an organization, if you go, you need to give them laptops, right? You, that particular person, if he wants to work and doesn't have a laptop, so the company provides the laptop, correct? So if the company does not have, you know, the uh, cannot provide a laptop or to every person, okay? So what what do they do? They create a rem they create a virtual desktop for those first people, okay? So if they want to share the same environment okay let's say it's a team that they are working for one project okay and if they want to share the same environment okay they can go uh it is more pass actually um if i have to look at it it will be more It will be depending, like it will be more IAS. It depends on the uh, access that you have. Yeah, it is more IAS, I think. Yeah, so you don't have to know about how, what is IAS and all, I mean, in this situation, but yeah, it is more IAS oriented as per my knowledge. Okay, so, um, Virtual desktop, yeah. So if people are on the same team, okay, and they want to share things instead of giving different laptops or something, people can come here and create a full, they can have a full virtualized environment of that and uh, uh, of whatever they are doing, share, upload, okay. If they are on some other, uh, uh, in some other region, okay, they're working from home and they cannot come to the office, okay, they can create multi sessions, okay, and uh, anyone can log in from anywhere, plus they have to install, you know how any desk works, any desk, I don't know if you have heard of it. So somewhat similar to that, okay, so if you have the access to the environment created, Okay, so if you wherever you are, if you have the uh, file or the remote accessibility, it's the same thing over here. Okay, but uh, not just that you can upload things, share things. Okay, uh, not just view or have a control of that particular environment. Okay. No, virtual desktop will not share the same VM. And yeah, no, it's a yeah, it is kind of the same VM. Yes, it will. So it is the same thing. Just it will be divided among your teammates. OK, uh, this person will use this much of RAM and so and so forth. OK, so they will have apart from that, they can also log in from anywhere they want and they just have to use the. Yes, uh, yes, similar to that. OK. So uh, this is what is virtual desktop. You have an access to that. You can create host pools. You can create multiple uh, virtual machines inside that so that people can use it. OK, share things. That's for what uh, virtual desktop is used. Then you have something called as container services. Do you all know what are containers? Do you all know what are containers, guys? Have you all uh, heard of microservices? 
Yes, guys, have you all heard of microservices? Okay. So a microservice, okay, is let's say, uh, let's take Amazon uh, web service, not the uh, this thing, but Amazon India, okay, the shopping e-commerce website, okay. So when we go to Amazon, okay, uh, there are lots of things that are there available, right? So one is like you can have, a, you have a service for just search, Okay, to search products, right? Then you have one service where it takes care of the billing that you have to do, okay, for billing. Okay, then you have one service which will give you the recommendations, offers, deals for that day. Okay. So what are these small, small services? Okay. So these small, small services, okay, once they are packaged together, that particular service is called as a micro service. All these, okay, are kind of different services available on one platform that is the amazon.in correct so when we have something where there are small small services so what happens is probably um this particular service okay was written in python code if billing was probably written in java code the environment to run a billing service is different Okay, let's say it. this thing is using more of a Windows op approach or Linux approach. This can use any of the environment. Okay. So if I have to, okay, create this, this kind of an environment, okay, we go for a service called as containers. So what does containers do? They provide you with isolation. So let any service, okay, be uh, written in, uh, let's say, uh, Java, Python, okay. So one service will not interfere with the other service. So this is where containers come into picture. So instead of using a virtual machine, then you put a hypervisor, then you put a guest host, uh, uh, guest OS, sorry. Okay, earlier when we didn't have containers, Okay, the situation would be something like this, right? Let's say this is my application. Okay. So this is, let's say, the server. Okay. Then on top of that, we would have a host OS. Okay. Windows, Linux, whatever. And then we would need to install a hypervisor. Okay. And then what service you want to install. And let's say you are going for a billing this thing. Okay. So you would require a OS for that. So you would have another OS. Let's say you have for billing and for offers, you have two services. So you will need, require two guest OSs or operating systems, correct? Then whatever libraries, these uh, coding uh, 
program needs okay that you would need to install correct and then you would install the application so this was how it would work earlier when there were no containers okay so this is probably your app a and this is probably another app okay or let's say the service in this situation okay so this would be the case but then when so that so before containers came in i had to install hypervisor i had to install another operating system don't you think this pro this particular installation will take a lot of time and will take up a lot of memory don't you think it will take up a lot of space right so won't it be slower if i have if my if i have to access any of the service and let's say i want to go and do my billing my cart is full my billing is i want to do my billing so don't you think it will take a lot of time to just bill one person yes so in that case what the developers did is that okay let's bring in something called as containers okay so what did containers do so now if i have to deploy an application you have the server you have a host os now you no longer need any hypervisor or guest os all you can do is just have a container installed and the container will now come packaged with the libraries with the environment okay for your application okay so server host os then you have a container now the popular container we all know is called as the docker container okay and then on top of that you will have your application let's say app or your service app a which will have its own library or service another service so don't you think this will become more fast it doesn't have need to have another os installed then the libraries and then access the application so instead what happened is that docker said okay let it be i'll do one thing i'll come packaged with everything what environment app a needs i will provide whatever environment app b needs i will provide just install it in just install uh, the specific app that you or the service that you want so that's what containers got it got the isolation okay apart from that if you want to do virtualization within virtualization like whenever you install any app right on your mobile or on your desktop okay you already have a host os you have a machine you have a os running on top of that so do you every time like have to install another operating system first of all install a hypervisor then install another operating system no you no longer need that so the if you the app comes with a container okay and sets up its own environment okay on top of this environment and whatever packages libraries it needs it starts running so this is what containers got with it so containers are like virtualization within virtualization okay so it can host multiple operating system whether you have written uh, you are using linux based windows based it will come in package within it the libraries package within it you write any code in any code it can be like i have we have windows uh, operating system over here but probably if i want to run a, a linux operating system no worries or let's say some other application is running a linux based operating system okay requires that so it will be just package in that container okay and whatever environment it requires it will create without taking any space okay without using much of the cpu and all and manage your 
services or applications that you have deployed. So if you want to do that online with your websites, with your uh, application on the cloud, okay, there are two services to do that. One service is the Azure Container instance, and the other is the Kubernetes service. Okay, so since, yeah, and one more advantage of using a container. Yes, so it is better. So if you run it on a cloud, it becomes much more easy. Okay, and uh, it, it will become faster in order to work around the application. So you can create it by two ways. And of course, containers are lightweight. They do not occupy much space as how hypervisor will use the or divide the compute uh, or, you know, how the guest OS will use the compute of your a machine or some or like that. OK, you don't have to install another contain or, you know, another operating system on top of that. OK. Yeah, you can create a container instance for your app. It will be created. OK, so there are two in, uh, services. One is con Azure Container Instance. It, they both are pass offerings. OK, uh, now what do I mean by pass? We, I'll, uh, I've already told you all. OK, and they will give you a virtualized environment, not much, um, mem uh, you know, uh, it will be lightweight, not much compute power will be required, not many resources on that, how a machine actually takes up. OK, so. Uh, and whereas uh, in Kubernetes, the most uh, common sort of, I mean, the most common uh, uh, thing about Kubernetes is that it provides orchestration. So if uh, uh, the Azure container instance is very much less in terms of scalability, okay, the scalability is very less in terms of Azure instance, but Kubernetes does that automatically. It orchestrates your containers. If that particular service, the billing instance, let's take the billing, billing uh, service, requires more containers in order to manage. There's lots of people billing at the same time on Amazon.in, okay? So you need to have that orchestration, automatic scaling that will happen. That is brought in by Azure Kubernetes service, okay? So now imagine instead of VM containers being scaled, okay? So it can manage large amount of Data. So that's the difference between container instance and Kubernetes. Scaling is not possible in containers, but uh, Kubernetes, and this is automatic scaling, okay, auto scaling it will do. And whenever there's a large volume of data that is coming, it will be managed in Azure Kubernetes service. Okay. So these are pass offerings, container services. If you want to work with containers instead of virtual machine, you can run a container on top of the virtual machine. That is also uh, possible. Okay. Now coming to Azure functions. Okay. Um, let's say you are working in IoT sector. Uh, sector. So do you know what is IoT? What is Internet of Things? Yes. No. Smart watches, smart homes, uh, smart cars like the Tesla car, right? You know all of that, right? So, in um, when uh, let's say I have a specific event, okay? So in smart home, let's say uh, that I'm monitoring the temperature, okay? I am monitoring the temperature, okay? So IoT basically is. Uh, something called as Internet of Things, okay? It is uh, you are collecting information from devices, okay? And you are giving it to the Internet or to the cloud in this situation, okay? So for example, if I am in a room, okay? And I want to monitor the temperature, okay? So if, no, not like Alexa, it's not like Alexa, okay? So if I want to monitor the temperature, let's say the temperature is gone above 
30 degrees centigrade or 40 degrees centigrade. OK, and it is hot. So I want some I want uh, my device OK to switch on the AC. OK, if the temperature goes above 40 degrees centigrade. So in that situation, what have I done? I have created an event. Right, stating that OK, if the temperature goes beyond 40 degrees centigrade, please switch on the AC. Right, so when um, when there is some when there is a trigger you know, or an event that has occurred for in this case, the temperature has gone above 40 degrees centigrade. OK, so if I want the AC to switch on, I need to give it a command. Right, please switch on the AC if the temperature has gone above 30 or 40 degree centigrade. So this is an event that is there, right? So the temperature sensors have calculated, got me the information, okay, and have shared the information, okay, and they are um, now they have seen, okay, the temperature has gone above 40 degree centigrade. So now what it will do, it will Give a command, OK, please switch on the AC. So this is a trigger or this is an event. So if I want to manage some events like this, OK, and move my focus on code, OK, move my uh, entire, put my energy into code rather than wondering about the underlying infrastructure. OK, what infrastructure I will need and uh, how much resources will I need if I don't want to worry about that. For that, Azure has given us a service called as Azure Functions. OK, so if I want to work uh, solely and solely on the code. OK, I will use something called as Azure Functions. So it is called as infrastructure. As a code. This particular service is called as infrastructure as a code. It means it is serverless. OK, it, it is serverless. OK, now what do I mean by serverless? Serverless does not mean there is no server. There is a server, but it's something that you are not configuring. OK, it is something that is taken care by Azure. OK, so if now up till now all the services that we saw, we were working on the server, we were configuring the virtual machine that we saw. OK, it's nothing but like a server, right? So we were doing the configuration. But let's say I don't want to do that. I want to just focus on the code, writing the code, writing an event OK, so that I can quickly and in, in much yeah, quickly and uh, uh, in a much faster way, deploy my application or my website. So that is called as a Azure function. So let's just quickly see how you can do that. OK, so here we are going to trigger. We are going to put a HTTP trigger. OK, so the moment a trigger of from the HTTP comes, the function will do the necessary will give you the necessary output. So here I will not be doing much of the configurations as I show you. OK, and let's just see how to do that. function app come here i'm going to say create i'm going to use the same resource group i'm going to give it a name i function app and today's date is let's see if it accepts 04 because it's today's date it okay. so here you can see you can go if you have a pre existing container image with all the requirements, you can put it here. Otherwise, you can just focus on de deploying it as a code. OK, you can focus on that. Now here you can select what runtime do you want? What code do you want? 
Okay, so I'm going to go with Python. Okay, and it has given me the latest uh, version of Python. You can select whatever version you want. Okay, then this is all fine. So you can see it is serverless. I'm going for serverless consumption. So I'm not doing any uh, management of servers. I'm not working on uh, any uh, creation of virtual machines or anything, nothing in the background, nothing infrastructure wise. Okay, so here now I'll just click on review plus and I'll just say create. Okay, this is taking time. So till then we will move ahead and then we'll come back to this. Um, you can, but uh, if you go for functions, uh, it is not your responsibility to see. Okay, uh, it will be done by Azure depending on your need. Okay, you just have to select the code in which you're going to write or if you ha already have a image container image created okay uh, you will have to read about containers and all in depth so i will not be teaching you all that here okay but if you have a image already for it okay you can just put it into the registry and you can upload it over here that is also fine okay so but if you want to focus on coding this is one good or uh, service that is there. So guys, if you want to know more about this, since this is a very fundamental uh, uh, training, okay? If you want to go in depth, work with this, okay? There is a certification called as AZ204, okay? It is something that is, uh, you. Uh, it is focusing on the developers, okay? If you want to go into development, okay? Using Azure as the cloud, Okay, whether you want to create applications, work with databases, work with a uh, function app, okay, create, uh, you know, uh, create triggers, event based kind of a situation app you want to create, okay, you can go for AZ204. Okay, that's the certification. And if you want to get trained on it, you can come back to us for it. Then this is a comparison between virtual machines, desktop, and a container. Okay, so you can just read through this at the moment. Just one minute, the app is not working. Yeah, okay. Now it has started the deployment. Okay. 
so this is just a, a comparison between the compute options that you have you can go for virtual machine you can go for virtual desktop you can go for containers inside that if you want a container instance or a kubernetes you can decide and then another compute option that you have is the app services okay so if you want to create a full you want to create your own application using any code Okay, if you know .NET, you know .NET Core, you know Node.js, you know Python, you know Java or you know PHP, you can just use it, upload your HTML file on top of it, create a image, okay, HTML, uh, you can write it and you can do the scalability, you can man uh, configure the security, compliance, all of that using the app services. So if you are familiar with how a website or an application is created how or how an api is created you know the challenges right so if you don't want to face those challenges you can just come here okay just give it give basic configurations yeah containers uh were not uh they were also pass offerings only is uh, offering in azure is the virtual machine that is there. Containers is still a pass offering that is there in Azure. Though they are listed in, it is a compute uh, uh, service. Okay, it's a compute service, but it's not IAS, it is more pass. Uh, I don't know the difference between .NET and .NET. Net core, sorry, I'm not from that background. I have a Python background, so you'll have to check on that. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't help you with that. Uh, but if you have ever worked on creating APIs, okay, so you know the challenges you need to write so many codes, list them one under the other, okay, upload an HTML code dot index, I mean, index dot HTML or something, right? So you know the challenges of you know uh, deploying an api but if you want to deploy an api faster you can use the app services of azure so let me just check the yeah yeah the function app is ready so we'll just go over there quickly then i will show you all about app services on azure as well how you can create it yeah so here you can see your function app has been created. Okay, so now I am going to navigate to functions. Here, I'm going to create a function. Okay, so like I told you, a function is nothing but a event-based uh, trigger or a trigger. Okay, like I told you, the temperature has gone above 40 degrees centigrade. Okay, so what to do next? If you have to determine so for that you need to fire a trigger right you need to have a notification okay it has gone above 30, 40 degrees centigrade or 30 degrees centigrade then only your device or your appliance or ac for that matter will be switched on right so if you have to configure that you need to give it a function or a trigger right so that's what we are doing over here so i'm going to go for a basic http trigger not just HTTP, you have lots of options, guys, for triggers. You can just check other options that are there. Okay, but I'm going to go for the HTTP trigger and I'm going to say create. So now it has created a HTTP trigger. Okay. So let it just load. Uh, there's not much difference between 
uh, Docker and container. One of uh, Docker is the so, service that provides containers. Okay, so um, yeah, so uh, Docker is a container. Basically, it's a service. Okay, so if you want to create a container, Docker is one of the popular services that are there available. So Microsoft kind of has tied up with Docker in order to provide so that you don't have to, you know, specifically go install Docker. You can just come into Azure portal and you can create a Docker container for yourself. So there is, like I told you, if you want to work with uh, uh, applications or work around databases, okay, uh, you there is a certification called as AZ204. Okay, it's uh, a certification for the developers. Okay, if you want to develop applications, you want to develop uh, link databases to those applications or work with um, uh, function apps, okay, or websites or something like that, uh, you have a certification for that. So you can definitely see that particular uh, certification. Sorry, guys, I think I'm facing some network problem. Refresh. Okay, till then I can't do much. Sorry, guys, there's some network issues that I'm facing because of that. It's not loading. Could have. It's not working for those reasons. It's not set. I mean, it's not identifying the app. So, like I told you, you all will need good internet connectivity. So, that's the challenge I am facing at the moment. Sorry, guys, if it works in the end, I will try. But as of now, we'll have to move ahead. OK, we have lots to cover still. OK, but I will try and see if it will work at the end. OK. Yeah, so we'll move on to the uh, app service. OK, so I'll just search for Azure app service. So you can come here to app services. So you can see these are nothing but past services. OK, uh, yeah, here also you can see a function app is being created. OK, but if you want to go for a web app, you can just come here and create one. I'm going to go with the same resource group. Give it a name. OK. I'll go for .NET and it will do all the requirements, necessary setups. Okay, and I'll just say review plus create. And I'll just say create. Let's see if this works.
Okay, so the app is ready. So I'll go to the resource. So if you come here, so this you can see is a by so on uh, API has been created by default. So if I just click on this, so you can see a um, default environment has been created. Okay, but if you want, you can also create your own APIs. So for that, you will have to. Um, sorry, guys. Yeah. Just one minute. Network problems. So I'm just sorry that. Yeah. So here, if you come, just loading. Yeah. So if you come here, and uh, you can uh, come to this. If you come to this environment, you can uh, come here and create your own APIs deployments. Okay. If you have any, you can just upload the code over here. If you come to environment. to the path, okay, you can just see, you'll get information. You can upload uh, your HTML file either through the command shell, sorry, to the uh, command prompt or through the PowerShell, okay. Um, there are lots of ways in which you can upload the code. Okay, so but you'll have to create your own HTML code, okay, and put it over here, okay, onto this. So if you want to know more about this, you can do a, a like I told you, you can have an AZ two not four certification, and you can from end to end you can read or learn about how to create or create your own API in a much faster way. Okay, so that's what is. Uh, this is how you can create an app service. Now I'll just come to my function app. Let's see if that's working. So you all want to see the app service or what do you want to see? I'm sorry, I thought my screen was visible. Is it still frozen, guys? Okay, I'll do the app service again. The function is not working. I'm sorry. I'll try it at the end later, probably. It's just not loading. So I'll just quickly read this app service that I have created and I will show how to create a new one.
Yeah, I'm not sharing my screen. Just give me two minutes. Just deleting the app. And I'll show it again to your. So just a quick confirmation, guys. Can you see my screen now? Just put yes, no, or thumbs up in the, or, or just give me a reaction. Okay, great. So if you come to home and you can search for app services, okay, and you can come in here. And you can create your own app. So you have three options. So I'm going to go with web app. Okay. I'll select the same resource group. Say my web app and 004. Today's date is 4th. That is why I'm going with that. You can select whatever environment you want. It is up to you. Okay, you have lots of options. So if you know a specific code, you can go for that. But now I'll go for .NET 6. OK, and I'll just click on review plus create. My screen is still visible, right, guys? Please just let me know because I'll not come to know if the net goes down. OK, great. Now click on create. So it will take some time. Deploy. So the deployment is successful. Let's go to the resource. So if you see, this is your default uh, domain that has been created. So if you click on this, so you can see whatever is the default environment, okay, default HTML file that Azure has, it is running that. But if you want to create your own environment, okay, so you can come to the deployment center. Okay, if you want to create your own API or something, you can come in over here. Right. You can come to yeah, come to advanced tools. You can click on go. So here you can come in and you can upload your HTML file that you have. OK, so if you know HTML, you can come in, you can give it extensions. OK, um, and you can list whatever files you have in order to create your own uh, in, um, image. OK, instead of the default one that we saw over here. 
so that you can have your own API. Okay, so you can instead of this, you can have another API slash something. If you have an HTML file, you can come to come over here. Okay, and you can definitely install it. You can use CMD PowerShell in order to upload your files. Okay, from your local system onto this. So you can put in the appropriate this thing. Okay, all your files you can put in over here and you can uh, create. So if you see plus option, you can go with file and you can create one. Okay, or you can simply upload it. For that, you will need to learn. If you want to do it, you will you can go for the AZ204 certification and you can learn more in detail about this. So this is how you can work with an app. OK, so all these settings are there in order to create a REST API. OK, and you can see how fast it was for me to create this basic app. OK, I didn't have to worry about the environment, nothing. Just specify which programming language I'm using and I can just create a uh, endpoint for it. OK, so you can just upload it to your service and you can. Uh, you can upload it from your desk, sorry, from your local machine and you can work around with it. OK, so this is how you can create a simple web app. OK, you will have to. I'm not going much in details about this uh, since this is a fundamental certification. OK, so and I can give you the links from where you can study all of this and try it on your own. So let me just delete this. So with this, we bring an end to the compute services in Azure. OK, so we saw the different compute services that is virtual machine, containers, virtual desktop, app services, um, Kubernetes, OK, uh, function app. What is a function? Uh, all of those. So except for VMs and desktop, uh, you have everything that is as oriented. You saw I was not thinking about uh, what environment will I need. Uh, Azure has a default environment for everything. So if you go for Python, Python works better on Linux. OK, if you are using .NET or something, it works better on Windows. So there are certain default configurations that Azure already has. OK, so it's just what language, programming language you're comfortable with, you use that. Now let's move on to the networking services in Azure. OK, so let's say for your application, you want 10 virtual machines, you want multiple databases, you want lots and lots of uh, virtual machines. OK, so it's better to put it under one network. OK, so that accessibility and communication between VMs or over the Internet, or let's say you have some services deployed on the on premise environment or on a private cloud and you want to communicate with some services on the public cloud. OK, so if you put them under one network, right, it becomes easy. So that's what if you want to do Azure has certain uh, services for that. One of the services is the Azure Virtual Network. So what is a virtual network? OK, so it's like, of course, a network where you can communicate between virtual machines, uh, uh, databases, OK, either through public endpoints 
that means it is accessible from the internet if they if it's a public endpoint it's a public ip otherwise if you don't want to access it from other parts of the internet you want to keep it private you will go for a private endpoint okay so only the people or the sorry only the so uh, virtual machines or databases that are part of that network can communicate with the other virtual machine okay uh, if it's a private endpoint then you can create segments of your network from this ip address to this ip address okay if uh, which virtual machines you want to allocate to it then from this ip address to the other ip address what you want what much virtual machines you want or what database you want you can do that so that process is called as subnetting right so you can create subnets of your network according to your needs okay and you can put in how much ever work uh, uh, which virtual machines you want to put in you can do that then you have network peering so if you still if you have a private network but still want to communicate share information you can go for a uh, network peering service okay which is also a part of the virtual network okay so since private communications are you know restricted they don't have much you can't do uh, much about it so but still if you want to communicate or connect to the private network you can go for a peering then what are the capabilities of azure uh, virtual network it what kind of uh, benefits it brings if you have a virtual network of course there's isolation segmentation okay you can have a better communication between resources in within the same network okay how you can like uh, direct the traffic or not direct so if there is a cyber attack or some network or you know some ip address that is not is malicious in nature okay it's uh, something that is that you think is going to cause harm so how you can handle that okay it's better if you have a virtual network created okay so if you recall when we created a vm i showed you there's a by default uh, virtual uh, there's a virtual network that gets created okay so if you create another vm so it will by default take that virtual network itself okay so this is how you can uh, put in multiple vms multiple databases under one network okay and if you want you can communicate between two networks as well like i told you you have certain set of machines on the on premise so one network is that you have another set of vms on the cloud public cloud so you have a vm that there so if you want to create you want to communicate between them you can do that as well so let's say you want to create you want to you know uh, put those on a private endpoint okay you can do that so for that azure has a service a dedicated service called as the virtual private network so what will this do it will keep your um, keep your network private it will not be made public okay or uh, uh, but it will be public within the uh, i mean for the uh, networks that are communicating okay the services that are there inside so for them of course they for them it will be public but it will not be available to the other people so let's say you have taken a range of ip address and you have kept, kept that private so that range of ip addresses will not be available to the or the public will not be able to see those because it is kept for you but then if you want to keep it private okay you want to keep your messages encrypted you don't want it to be uh or sent over the public cloud internet okay you will go for a virtual private network then let's say if you have a lot you have on premise you have machines on the on premise and on the cloud okay but it requires a lot of bandwidth okay the data that you are transferring communicating okay and uh, it requires really really high bandwidth and still you want to keep the network private okay you can go for something called as azure express route okay it's some it's again a, a private network onto the azure okay like you are communicating you're extending your private uh, sorry private cloud onto the azure cloud but you want to keep it private 
okay but and it requires a lot of uh, um, bandwidth in order to communicate between these two okay like you're using sharepoint or uh, microsoft 365 applications so they require a lot of bandwidth so if you want to keep that private that channel private you will go for the as your express route so this is the other service that is there then apart from that you have the azure dns so have you heard of uh, godaddy.com what is a go what is godaddy i'm sorry not godaddy.com what is godaddy can you all like tell me hello am i not audible to provide dns or to register dns or or to register your domain name yes web hosting solution and apart from that can you register your own website over there right so when you register a website with the domain name and so and so forth right so when i go to google and i type in your website name okay so when i type that website name does the server know okay www dot example like let's say www dot so and so website is part of this particular uh, uh is a part of this uh, is you know the website okay and you have to display that particular website to the user so do you think the server will understand okay this is www dot uh, let's say example dot com so no right so there has to be someone who has to change the name okay of that www.example.com to a ip address and that ip address is nothing but the server will understand okay it's something that the server will understand and will get you the uh, location or the website available to you it's not going to understand www.example.com though you have registered the name as with this name but when you when a person enters this request okay though you're putting www.example.com it's not something that the server at the uh, uh, at go or go daddy will understand it will understand what it will understand the ip address so if i want a service similar to the instead of you know going to godaddy and using its server okay azure has created another server service on azure itself and it is called as azure dns that is the azure domain name service okay here mind you you can't register a domain name but if you want the your uh, so you know you want to access any domain names okay from the name server so as your host its own name server and that service is called as uh, dns as your dns so consider this as your phone book we have a phone book right or a, a contact list on our phone so if you want to go uh, i'm not aware of uh, Uh, so if you want to go calling your friend you just go and you put in the uh, you just search for the name right but at the back end do you think the processors or the sim card is going to understand that no the sim card will understand the frequency that is the number your friend has so it's the same thing with the dns service over here so here you don't register the domain name here it will direct the dns service will direct this domain name to that particular location okay so it will help you find websites using user friendly name so instead of using the godaddy name server you can use the azure dns service so of course you have a better uh, you can manage it it's much better customizable all those features are there in this particular service of course since azure's name has come in so reliability is also a big thing correct so that is why azure has its own domain name service 
Now with this, we end the networking service. There's not much about it. Earlier syllabus had a lot. Actually, there we had about network security groups, Azure firewalls and all of that. It's not a part of this of it right now. OK, so it's just restricted to this. OK, so we fin we are finished with the networking services. Uh, if time permits, I will show you all the uh, I'll show how how to create a virtual network. OK, and all, all the subnet and all of that, how you can configure. I'll just show it to you all. We will not implement it. OK. So now coming to the storage services in Azure. OK, so we all know like when we have to store any files or anything, right? We uh, you, we have a, a storage in our local machine, right? So if I want to store anything on Azure, OK, uh, Azure has given me a storage service. So can you tell me the two ways? OK, there are two ways in which we can store data. In today's time, OK, we know that data is really, really important, right? We know it is it is something it is the oil it is the uh, most important thing and every company requires data from here and there right so if i have to store this data there are two formats in which i can store this data can you tell me those two formats and uh, no not in terms of that i mean in terms of data these are protocols that you are talking about. HTTP and HTTPS are protocols. I am talking in terms of data. Now let's focus on data. Can you all tell me the types of data? Do you all know what are the types of data? Yeah, guys, do you all know the types of data? Okay, structured, unstructured, correct? So, so data okay uh, that we get nowadays is of or data is basically of three types one is the structured data then we have is the unstructured data and then another form is the semi structured data so structured form of data okay for example if i have to give in your um, csv format okay that is the comma csv format comma separated values then you have um Yes, guys, do you all know examples of CSV? I mean, sorry, of structured data apart from CSV?
for aquí. Give me a moment. Okay, so these are the three types of data that we have. Okay, so structured is basically uh, all about tables and rows. Okay, then unstructured does not have any schema. Okay, no fixed structure it, uh, we have. Okay, uh, there is no structure. Whereas structure definitely has a structure in a fixed schema like rows, tables, what type of data they will have, what kind of data they will hold that is the uh, integer or float or decimal value, what it will store. Okay, so it has a structure to it. Correct. Then we have the semi structure, which is more in terms of the key value pair. Okay, so this these are the types of data that we have. OK. But now if I want to store these types of data, OK, I have two ways in which I can store. One is the file format. The other is the database. So database is nothing but your structured data, which contains of tables, correct, or relational data. But files are something that are like you have rightly mentioned CSV, JSON. OK, these are nothing but formats of the file, correct? Formats in which files are stored. So you have JSON, you have uh, CSV, you have XML, you have the doc, or you have TXT, that is the text file. OK, or you can have something called as block. OK, which is nothing but binary large objects, right? Your unstructured data is basically stored in these format, like your uh, image files, that is the JPEG file, OK? Your PNG file, OK? All of this is nothing but uh, examples of unstructured blob data, OK? So these are the ways of formats in which data is stored. OK. So if I want to store data on the cloud, OK, instead of filling my local machine with lots of lots of files and all, you have no space, like how you store your uh, images, right? Where do you store your images? Normally, people use Google Drive. Right? So it's nothing but that only. You're storing it online. So if I want to store any, if I want to store files, okay, onto my, uh, onto the cloud, I will use the storage account service available on cloud. So here you can store any format of file, OK, whether it's JSON, it is CSV, it is XML, it is text file, OK, or you can uh, even store your images, OK, which is large in size, your blob storage onto these services. But if the data is relational in nature, OK, this is for. This is for unstructured and uh, semi-structured data, OK? okay but if you want to store relational data, that is tables or create a database, OK? So here you will go for the you'll go for the data basis. Okay, so if I want to store these files, 
OK, instead of on my local desk, on my local computer, I can go and put it online as well. So if I want to do that, Azure has a service called as the uh, uh, storage account. So storage account is divided into uh, four types. Uh, one is the blob storage. The other is the file storage. Then we have is the disk and there are two more. That is the table and the uh, queue storage. OK, so these are the different services available inside the storage account service of Azure. So a blob storage, like I told you, if you want to store unstructured data, CSV, text, uh, image files, OK, you can do that. And the service is called as the container or the blob storage. So if you are working with virtual machines, OK, and you want to have your own customized image, OK, the dot VHD files, OK, so you can store that data in uh, this storage. Then if you want to uh, share data between virtual machines, share files between virtual machines, then you can use the Azure file storage. OK, so it uses two protocols. That is the server message block and the network file system. NFS and the SMB. These are the two protocols that it uses in order to uh, share files on on premise or on virtual machines. OK. Now, if you recall, we saw some options as to how to make a VM highly available, right? So now let's say if I want to make or you know I want to back up my data, OK, or I want to make my data redundant, sorry, redundant, OK? Azure has given us four options for it, OK? So those four options are uh, the LRS, ZRS and the uh, and the other two are GRS and GZRS. OK, so um, let's just understand how these redundant services work. How can one use them? Or how what is the back? How, how does it work in the background? OK. So if you recall in the morning, we had discussed about uh, regions and region pair. So let's say this is my region one or my primary region. This is my secondary region. Or region two, which is link to my primary region. So in a region, I told you all there are quota present, there are availability zones present. Right? Three availability zones we have. OK. So this is AZ1. We have AZ2 and AZ. Three. OK. So when I say. So redundancy. Basically means backup. OK, of your data. OK, basically means if you want to back up your data, OK, you need to make it highly redundant. So we saw how to, you know, make your data highly available. Sorry, how to make your VMs highly available. So similarly, if you want your data also be available, OK, so you need to go for three, sorry, four redundancy options. So the first one. Is the LRS that is the locally. Redundant storage. 
So what does LRS state? LRS says, okay, it will make three. Uh, it will make uh, one second, three copies. Okay, so it states that it will make three copies of your data within the same data center. Now, what do I mean by this? Okay, so I told you in an availability zone, there are data centers present, right? It can be one, two, three. Okay, we don't know that. Okay, and data centers have racks, correct? If you all recall, I told you all in the morning. So let's say my data is present on rack one of availability zone data center one. Okay, I'll call this data center one. Now let's say for some reason this rack goes down. This rack is not work working. OK, some electricity problem, firmware updates, the servers are going under uh, updates. OK, all of that, the same reasons that we saw when we looked at VM scales, uh, sorry, when we looked at availability sets, right? So do you think if there is no electricity to this rack, there is no, uh, there is updates going on, do you think this data that you have will be available to you? Yes, guys, do you think it will be available to you? No, right? So why? Because there is no backup of your data. So if I go for LRS, so LRS states, okay, that it will make three copies of your data within the same data center. So now tell me if this rack goes down, Okay, if this rack is no longer work working, will my data now be available? Right, it will be available. Still, it will be available to me because it will prevent my data at, it will make data available for me for rack level failure if there is a failure at the rack level okay now there is one more thing that is to be added to this definition and that is instead of this now another definition of lrs states that It will make three synchronous copies of your data within the data center. Now, what do I mean by synchronous? So synchronous means when you are uploading the data into your storage account, at the same time, the copies of your data will be created within that data center. So this is what synchronous means. At the same time, these, these copies that are created will be done when you upload or make your data redundant. Okay, so this is what is LRS. But now, let, let's say this entire data center goes down. 
it's no longer functioning. There is no electricity. There is update going on in the entire data center. Do you think LRS will then back up my data? Will make my data redundant? Do you think that will happen? No, right? So in order to prevent my data from a data center level, I will need another redundant service, right? So that redundant other, another service is called as zone redundant storage or the ZRS. So now what does ZRS uh, de defines or tells us? Okay, it says make, make three copies, three synchronous copies of your data within or across the availability zones. So now what it will do, not just back up your data, on this particular data center. Will not just make a copy of your day of your data at availability zone one. OK, but make three copies on the other data centers of availability zone two and availability zone three. So now tell me, will it help me if this data center goes down? Is my data still backed up? Will my data still be available? Yes, correct. So this is called as the zone redundant storage. OK, even if there is a failure at the availability zone site at availability zone one, my data is backed up and it is done synchronously. OK, if you go for this ZRS option, it will go. It will be done synchronously. The moment you upload your data at the same time, that same data will be replicated on the other two availability zones. So this is called as a ZRS. But now let's say. The entire region goes down. Probably for because of some flood or natural calamity or the entire region is not getting any electricity or power failure is there. So do you think ZRS will help me there? Do you think ZRS will help me for zonal redundancy? Will it give me that redundancy? No. So I will need a much powerful service, correct? So for that, Azure has given us two options. That is the GRS, Geo Redundant Storage, which is nothing but LRS plus three asynchronous copies of your data. And the other is Geo zone redundant storage, which is nothing but ZRS plus three asynchronous copies of your data. So now what does this mean? So if you go for GRS, OK, so your data, what it will do? Will not just back up that region one, one data center, 
but it will back it up on the second region, right? Second region probably availability zone one, okay? AZ one, and on some uh one, another, some data center one of the sec of the second region, okay? On any of the rack. Okay, so this is what is the GRS redundant service. But what if in second region the available this entire data set is not there? Data center, sorry, is not available, has gone down. Even your region one has gone down. This data center has gone down. Now, do you think the data will be available? No. So for that, we have GZRS. So what this will do, it will not just back up data on availability zone one, but on availability zone two of the second region. Correct. And on the other availability zone, that is availability zone three of the secondary region. Of course, with this, with these two, you will need. And what do I mean by asynchronous? So when you are uploading data over here, OK, this data will not be backed up at the same time. OK, it will after, let's say, one hour, two hours after some delay. OK, not at the same time, the data will be backed up or made redundant. It will be done after some time. So that is why the term asynchronous has come into picture. OK, so. Of course, this is the cheapest option that is there. OK, but gradually if you go select some other option, the num the cost is going to increase, right? So but the durability of the data, OK, the redundancy of the data will be high for the GZRS, which is around 16 nines. It is around 99.9 back to 16 times. You can imagine the durability or the redundancy it can keep, okay, of your data. Okay, so these are the redundancy options that are available for your service. Okay, so the uh, Depends on what you choose, so the cost will increase, but the durability will be high. So here you can see, OK? This is what it is basically. So how much durability you are getting? OK. Now, apart from this, OK, so I told you these are the different uh, uh, storage options that you have. You have block storage, you have data. Data lake, I'll not explain what that is. OK, uh, but you have files, you have queue, you have table storage. Now, if you want to access any storage, OK, uh, Azure has given you four options. Actually, it's not three any longer. There are four access tiers that are there. Now, what do I mean by access tiers? No, it will not be up to date. It will be, uh, uh, you know, after some delay, it will not be synchronous. Yeah, it will not be updated. After some time, it will be updated probably. OK. Now coming to the access tier. So depending on the uh, how frequent you access the data okay you uh, your uh, you azure has given you four access tiers okay the first one is the hot access tier meaning the data is accessed frequently like you uh, every day go and access that particular data like if it's a, a, a highly critical data, so you will go and access it every day, right? So for that particular storage, you need a faster access, right? And that access is the hot access tier. 
The second access tier you have is the pool, which you don't access frequently. Okay, it is something that you access probably uh, after um, um, with you know like after a week or fifteen days or twenty days, but within thirty days. OK, let's say, for example, the sales data of your organization, like you don't access it frequently. You want to access it probably on a week's time or on a monthly basis, like last month, how much data did you, how much sale did you do this month? How much are you doing? OK, so for that purpose, you can go for the pool access tier. So the data that you are not going to frequently access, but you access it within 30 days. Then you have another access tier that is being given by Azure. It is called as the cold access tier. So what is cold? So cold, if you can, if cold gives you a chance to access for within 30 days, cold will give it to you for 90 days. OK, so within 90 days, you can access that particular data. OK, um, that for that there is a middle ground between archive and cool. That is the cold access here. Then archive, as the name says, archive, it will uh, no. you can access that data after like six months. That is 180 days. OK, you can. It's not really important. It's something that you don't frequently access. It's some, let's say, last year's sales data you want to know. OK, so why, why will you access it every day or even in a week's time or month's time or in 90 days? You will probably access it after a, after a quarter, you know, three months, four months or five months, right? Something like that. So if you want an access where you can Hey, you don't want to see it every day. You go for the archive access tier. So archive will have the cheap, it will be the cheapest of all. OK, so that you it's something that you will not access every day. OK, so. Uh, you can store your data, any historical data you wish to store. You can go in the archive tier. OK, so as the name says archive, it is going to archive that data as long as you don't access it. So now let's just see how to create a, a simple blob storage. OK, um, in Azure. OK, also just open my portal. I'll go to storage accounts. Let's say create. Select webinar. Give it a name. Your name has to be unique. So I'll just say my storage account zero zero four. Let's see if it takes. Yes, it is taking. So here you can see you will get the options to choose what redundancy you want. So I'll go for LRS. Okay, because mine is not a critical data. Okay, I can just for demonstration I'm doing. So I'll just now click on review. So once it has done the final validation. You can click on create.
Yes. So the resource is created. Let's go to the resource. So this is your uh, storage account. OK, so here you can see the four options. That is the containers, files, queues, tables. OK, so containers is used for block storage. So we can come here and store our images, text files, CSV. OK, any file you want to store, you can store it, but it requires a container. So give it a container with the name data and just say create. So you can see a container has been created. Now let's upload an image. So here, yeah. So if I upload an image, so I'll just browse for it quickly. I can go for any of these CSV files, text files. That is fine. OK, so I'll just go for this as of now. Getting upload option. Click on upload. So by default, it will uh, the access tier it will have is going to be uh, hot. OK, so here you can see. So this is by default the access tier. You can change the tier if you want. You can come here. You can see these are the four options that you have hot, cool, cold, archive. Cool will keep your data for 30 days within 30 days if you want to. OK, this will also work. You can go for cold. You can go for archive. So archive has the is the cheapest. Hot is, of course, the ex most cost intensive, right? Because it will charge you a lot, OK, in order to access that data. So I'm just updating. So earlier it was hot. Now it has become cool, OK? You can even see what is inside the data uh, in this file, OK? So this is how it will look like. So you can see the format here. OK, there are other formats as well. JSON and all. You can just change. You can see the preview for it. OK, you can even give access. OK, if you want to make it uh, public, private. OK, you can do that. OK, uh, you can share it. So by default, it is a private container. Nobody can access it. OK, but if you make it public and I share the link, this URL with you. So if I share this URL with you, I come in containers. Data. Where's that URL? Sorry. And if I share this URL with you, that is your credit. No, sorry, sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm getting so confused today. Yes, I come here. And I share this URL with you. OK, so it will be accessible to you as well. If I change the. Access of this data container, so you'll get all the access available. So by default, it is private. OK, but you can change the access level. But the file access is cool. OK, so you can access it within 30 days or you can Keep it hot. You can access it every day. That is up to you. I can even upload an image file or JPEG file. That is also possible. OK, it can be put in over here. So I'll just click on open. And it will get uploaded. So you can see I have a CSV file. I have a JPEG file all in one at one place. Right, so that is also possible. I can edit it. By default, it has again taken it to be hot. OK. You can change the tier accordingly, according to your need. Okay. 
So this is how you can work with storage. So if you want to know more about it, you can go to, uh, you can study about it in uh, DP 900. Okay, DP 900 uh, has this particular, has more information on uh, data and all of that. Okay. So then apart from this, you also have other services available on Azure for data. That is uh, something, if you want to do some migration operations, Okay, like you want to migrate a database from on-premise to Azure Cloud, that is also possible. For that, you have a service called as Azure Migrate. Okay, you can migrate any service, even a VM. Okay, you can do that. You can use the migrate service in order to do it. Okay, so this is all from migration perspective. Okay, if you are migrating, okay, you can use the Azure Migrate and there are lots of options for it. Then we have is the data box. So data box is like an actual box, okay, wherein you can uh, store data, okay, you can uh, give data, okay, um, or transfer data, okay. So you have to book this box with Azure, okay, and they will come and give you a box, okay, and you put all the data that you want, and you can keep it, uh, you can back it up in that entire one box itself so if you have data that is you know it it's 80 tbs in size okay and you want to recover this data in a faster way you put it in that box and you give it wherever you want to and you can uh, do any migration option or uh, uh, service with you can migrate your data to any place okay or you want to change or you want to protect the data while that data is being transferred you can use the data box service okay so it's just, it's actually like a physical box that is there okay this you don't need to know so now let's do one thing let's take a quick 20 minute break we is almost 4 40 so we'll resume the session at five o'clock Okay, where we have one more module to go and some uh, sample uh, where I will not be teaching much about this. It's just introduction to this module. Okay, we'll just quickly see, see this and then we'll complete uh, module three. Okay, so let's come back at five o'clock.
Yes, guys, I all back. Please quickly put it in the chat box. Okay, great. So we are almost towards the end of module two. Okay, now we are going to see the different identity access and security services on Azure. So the classic identity and identity service or and access management service that Azure uses is the Azure Active Directory. So what is an Active Directory? It is Basically, the I, it's it's something that contains your identity, okay? Something that you uh, are, okay? What is uh, uh, who is accessing as your, okay? Your login credentials, your username, your password, all of that. Where it is stored, it is stored in a directory, and that directory is called as as your active directory. So it is a proprietary Microsoft service. OK, that it uses in order to authenticate any user. OK, um, to find out what level of access that user has within the Azure or within or yeah, within the Azure environment. OK, is what is basically the Azure Active Directory. So why use Active Directory? What is the advantage of using Active Directory. The first is authentication. Like I told you, anyone can like if I have to validate who that person is. OK, uh, whether the person who has uh, a account created on Azure or not, or if uh, he or she has their account created on Azure. OK, uh, how can one person validate? It is through the Active Directory, so it stores the information of that person. OK, and if I have to use Azure, the first line where it will come and authenticate is through the Active Directory. Second advantage is single sign on. OK, so if I have an account on Azure, OK, I if uh, using that single using our same credentials, I can probably use Office 365. I can use any other service that is related to Microsoft. So I don't have to log in, keep on logging, login in again. OK, the moment I enter Office 365, I can use the Azure portal. I can use uh, any other service of Azure if I have the subscript, if I have the access to it, so I don't have to keep on signing in again. The other advantage is application management. No, it doesn't do authentication through all of that. It has uh, the authentication method is one method is the as your active directory. Then there are a couple of methods through which it can do uh, identification. OK, or authentication. OK, I will talk about that in some time. Then you can have application management. You can manage your application better if you have an active directory. OK, so uh, that is one of the advantages that is there. Then you can have a B2B uh, active directory like uh, if you want some business. If you have a business partner, OK, and he or she or like, let's say my organization, OK, is a business, right? We are running a big business of learning services. So we have a, a tie up. We can have a we can buy the uh, a license from Microsoft. OK, um, and we if we want to create a, as your uh, we want to create an Azure portal, it can help us through. I can just use my Synergetics ID. OK, and I can easily access the Azure portal. 
Why is that possible? Because Microsoft has a trust with Synergetics, okay, because of the B2B service that it has. Okay, okay, this is Microsoft. Okay, Microsoft will verify my Synergetics account through the trust it has built. Okay, and then only I will be allowed to in, uh, use the or use Azure services once I have validated myself and that can be done through the B2B service as well. The other way, uh, the other advantage is I can have a B2C connection. If I want to share my Azure services, I want somebody else to access my Azure services. Okay, I can add their credentials. I can to my Active Directory. Okay, and through that they can identify themselves and start using the Azure portal. So I can list multiple people's name in my directory. I can create a directory under that. Okay, and depending on that, I can give roles. Uh, what kind of roles I want to give, we can also decide on that. So they part, yeah. So B2B, if I have to talk about B2B, sorry. So this is something that is B2B. So like uh, we are Microsoft Gold Partners. Okay, so Microsoft has a trust with us. Okay, so it will give synergetics. Uh, like if like I'm using Office 365, applications so synergetics has a trust with microsoft okay so the moment i enter any of the um, 365 applications whether it's a document or word it's excel it's powerpoint it is onedrive if i use the synergetics id i don't have to uh, you know give any other uh, proof of me being uh, you know uh, that i cannot use Office 365 applications. I don't have to give any proof of that. My Synergetics ID is enough. Okay. Why? Because there is a trust built in. Okay. With the Microsoft service. So this is like a B2B. So if, I, if Microsoft has to identify who I am, based, it will only consider my Synergetics ID. So this is what is B2B. Then B2C is if I want to give uh, access to anyone. Okay, or Microsoft wants to give some third party access, let's say through an email. Like if I am not using my organization ID, I'm using my uh, uh, personal ID. Okay, so that is like a B2C connection that it is building up. Okay, so in that situation, so you have to first of all create an identity, you have to submit your username, password to Microsoft, then only a trust will be created. And once that is done, if you want to use the Azure services, you have to log in using that ID and it will validate that ID, authenticate that ID, and then only let you enter the Azure active, it will let you enter the Azure services, okay, or use the Azure services. So this is what is the advantage of the active directory, okay? So if you want to have dip and depending on the device and the application that you are using, OK, you can also authenticate yourself. OK, uh, I will talk about the device management uh, in some time. OK. Then earlier, uh, there was an Active Directory, Windows Active Directory, which was present on, uh, you know, it was for on premise people. Okay, who have whoever had their Active Directory created on the on premises. So instead of you know creating a new identity of themselves, as your thought, okay, let them use those same identity uh, and access management on the cloud. Okay, if they want, if they want to migrate or something like that. Okay, so in order to sync that uh, Active Directory, the on premise Active Directory with the cloud Active Directory, uh, Azure has got a service called as the Azure Active Directory domain service. Okay, so you just use the connector, okay, uh, for this and your Active Directory that was present on premise, which was used for identification in that situation, well, it can be migrated to the same services that are that you have deployed on the cloud. So for that, you have this particular service now coming to the authentication and the authorization okay then you have okay let's say you have created a directory for yourself on azure okay you first of all i told you you need to authenticate yourself okay and how do you do that uh then authentication basically means you need to identify yourself 
okay you need to tell azure okay who you are like you go to your office right nowadays it has become a common thing people go to the offices right so before you enter the offices do you need to do you need to show your identity card right that okay see i belong to this particular organization i have a valid identity card so this process of telling the security guard let's say okay ki i belong to this organization here is my id proof let me in this is what is called as authentication okay so authentication is the access or sorry is the way of verifying who you are and based on that then you can get a entry into the azure service then the other thing is authorization till where you can go okay do you have the access to this service do you have the access to this particular service or not is determined by authorization so once you have entered the premises of your organization it's not that everyone is allowed on every uh, in every room right probably it's a boss cabin you can't just enter like that you need a proper authorization or a permission to enter the boss's cabin or to enter certain rooms right that are there present in the organization so that's what basically authorization helps you with so for authentication there are multiple services that azure provides and the most popular service is the multi factor authentication so what is multi factor authentication you all use net banking correct we all use net banking we all uh, are familiar with the net banking services so when i have to use a net banking i i just entering my credentials that uh, tell the uh, as your uh, tell my net banking service is is not enough just entering my username and password is not enough to tell the organize to, to tell my bank okay this is who i am this is something that i know okay i know my username i know my password okay but that's not enough you need something you need additional information in order to authenticate that person and then what it will do it will send something called as otp right one time password why because you will have something that you possess like a mobile phone right it is something that you possess right so it will do what once you have entered okay you have fill in the credentials you know what it is okay you know your username you know your password but now it needs another layer of security it needs another layer okay just knowing your username password is not enough i want more so for that it will send an otp to your uh, device so this is how it does device management okay so it will send an otp to the registered device okay it is something that you will possess right it's not that something uh, people will nowadays people don't have right once that is done as you are saying that is still not enough for me i need more information i need more elements okay uh, i need to have more information about you about who you are so what it will do it will try and get something that you are be meaning facial recognition probably fin fingerprint scanning okay it is something that is different right not every person has the same fingerprints right it is something that you are so that's what is basically multi factor authentication so it is something that the uh, azure active directory will um, will use in order to identify you okay it thinks it, okay boss i think there is somebody else trying to access this as your services or office 365 i need additional information so for that you can use the as your multi factor authentication i'm pretty sure lots of organizations use multi factor authentication one thing knowing the username password is not enough nowadays people want otps okay or or a fingerprint uh something like that right so if you want to enable it for the azure services as well you go for the multi factor authentication okay then this i explained then now once you have authenticated yourself okay uh, at times what happens is like i told you there is somebody who is trying to access 
uh, there is someone else who is trying to access your Azure account, okay, or your Azure Active Directory, okay. So at times, Azure picks up certain signals, okay. Probably it is some other person who is trying to use your Azure uh, Active Directory or your Azure account, okay, or probably. I am only trying to access it, but I'm not accessing it from my regular Wi-Fi. It's not my home Wi-Fi. Let's say it's my office Wi-Fi. So the IP location or the IP address changes, right? So that is another signal that Azure receives or it thinks, okay, this is somebody else. It's not that person who is trying to use uh, the Azure services. Probably I've changed my device instead of my laptop. I'm using a mobile phone to access the applic to access my Azure. Okay, that can be a possibility, right? So, or the other possibility can be the application that I'm trying to use. Okay, some other application I'm trying to use, not through the portal, but through some API or through some other means. I'm trying to access my Azure uh, account. Right. So what are these? These are certain signals that it picks up and depending on these signals, it will apply a conditional access either to grant or not to grant depending on that. So in order to in enforce conditional access, it will have certain policies. It can use MFA. That is the multi factor authentication. OK, so these are the ways in which it can restrict or you can restrict if you have uh, the full right to the active directory you are not a part of any active directory you are the owner of the active directory and you want to uh, you know there is some third party person that you are allowing into azure you can put these restrictions put this conditional access on top of it and apply mfa so every time that person enters your azure active directory he or she will have to authenticate themselves through the things that they have, they possess, <laughs> or through facial recognition or fingerprint scanning. Then you can give role based access. Okay, let's say you have an intern joined for a couple of months. You do not want to give entire access to that person. Okay, and that intern. Uh, is responsible for creating only VMs. OK, so you can restrict that person's access to just creating VMs. OK, that is possible and that is done through the RBAC uh, service of Azure. OK, why you then why you can use this? It will give you, you know, a granular approach, a much uh, finer approach. OK, so that you can manage your uh, Azure account or your active directory in a much better way so that there is not much threat, not much tampering is done to your services already created in the Azure uh, cloud. So you can go for an RBAC approach. Now coming, so these were the identity and access services on Azure. Now let's come to the security services on Azure. OK, so there are a couple of security services. You, it's up to you what you want to enable. Azure does not have any default services that it gives. You have to configure these services. Like I told you all, NSGs, Azure Firewall, all of these you need to configure for that particular service. OK, so one such service is the zero trust. The name itself says trust no one. OK, or verify each and every person that enters your. Active directory or tries to use your Azure or tries to use any of these services. Trust no one. Have no trust on everyone. Sorry, have no trust on anyone. OK, so that's what basically zero trust is. OK, so there are three principles that is verify explicitly. Second, give least privileged access. Do not give much access if you do not want to give or you don't trust that person and always assume there is a there will be a breach. There will be a cyber attack. Always assume that. So just 
keep yourself as uh, keep trust no one okay and keep your uh, services or resources as secured as possible okay so this is what is the zero trust policy of azure then there is a defense in depth uh, uh, approach okay so this approach is top to bottom it goes from the physical then to your data so you can see since we all know data is very critical nowadays and on social media or anywhere our information just is leaked right it goes away okay so if you don't want that to happen you need to protect your data as much as possible so for that you can go for a layered approach okay you can go for a defense in depth approach so the first thing that if has to get attacked is your physical security okay that is taken care by the csp okay if any uh, any problem has to occur it will occur at that level okay just one minute guys one minute Yeah, so this is the approach. If there is a, a, first the security or the physical uh, aspect has to be uh, put on place. So it is the much secured uh, uh, way of, you know, uh, say protecting your data. Then you have the identity and access. So whatever identity and access services we saw, you can up, uh, you should apply for that. OK, like uh, uh, multi factor authentication. You can go for the RBAC access. I mean, RBAC service that is the role based access control. You can uh, go for a granular approach based on the role. Then you have the perimeter layer. OK, like all your DDoS attacks that can occur. You can put a DDoS uh, service over here. Azure has a DDoS protection service. I am pretty sure you all know what DDoS is distributed denial of service. OK, so if you want to protect it from that, as you can put it on the perimeter layer, then you have the network layer. This is where you can put your NSGs. No, sorry, you can put your Azure firewall. OK, uh, there is a service called as Azure firewall. We don't teach that in this particular AZ-900. It has been moved to the Azure uh, SC-900 certification. So if you want to know more about that, you can go over there. OK, so it's called as the Azure Firewall. So you can apply it on this layer. OK, and then your compute because your VMs, your databases, all of that is over here. OK, so in order to protect that, there is a service called as the Network Security Group, NSGs. I'll just write it down over here. So you would give rules, OK, NSGs, NS, NSGs, yeah. So you define rules, OK, depending on the IP addresses. And uh, lower the number to that rule, higher is the priority is what uh, NSGs are for. So we don't have time to actually cover that entire thing. And then you can have your application. There is a service called as Web Application Firewall, a WAF, for which you, if you want to protect any application, that is your app services or your uh, function app or something like that, you can go for the Web App Firewall. And then finally, your data are protected. OK, so that's the last layer which has to be breached. So, uh, so if any breach has to occur, it will go from the top to bottom. Then you have something called as Microsoft Defender for Cloud. What is Microsoft Defender for Cloud? It is basically a recommender so kind of a service, okay, where it will give you threats, it will give you alert, sorry, it will give you threat protection alerts before the or before any service you deploy or in general basically for your entire cloud service okay so uh, this service is not free okay you need to purchase this particular service in order to 
uh, get reports about your security. Um, uh, what kind of attacks can happen? What kind of threats can happen? OK, if you want to know before any service you deploy, OK, in general, if you want to know the uh, security posture, OK, it's called a security posture. OK, if you want to know about that, this particular service will enlighten you or give you recommendations for it. So uh, if you want to know, so if you want to know how good your posture is, it will give you something called as a security score. A score will be given. OK, and based on that score, you can determine how well your uh, Azure cloud is secure. OK, this is not free, guys. It requires a you need to pay for this particular service. OK, so with this, we end module two. We saw the different services on Azure, OK, uh, relating to compute, relating to network, relating to storage, relating to identity access and security. Now let's do module three wherein I will talk about different ways in which you can access your cloud. OK, it's not just through the portal. OK, you can do it through various other ways. OK, you can monitor any service that you have created. And apart from that, if you want to manage your cost, you can do that as well. So let's just see how to do that. So when we uh, are, you know, uh, configuring or creating any service on Azure, OK, there are certain factors that it that affects your cost. OK, so in the beginning, in the morning, you saw VM. Why did I go for HDD? Why did I go for the cheapest disk size and all of that? OK, so it was in order to save the cost. OK, so. Those are the factors that can actually affect your cost. OK, the first type first factor is the resource type. What kind of a service are you deploying? Whether it's a VM, it's a database. OK, it depends on that database costs more. VMs don't cost much than storage. OK, how much will it cost? OK, all these the type of the resource. Plays a crucial role in your cost. Then consumption, how long are you consumption uh, consuming the VM? Is it on the entire day? Is it off the entire day? So when you create a VM, guys, uh, though you can stop the VM, you can definitely stop the VM, but uh, you, you uh, it will charge you for the storage that it has on the cloud side, on the data center, but it will not charge you for the runtime. OK, it's like how you switch on the switch off the uh, electrical lights at your home. The moment you switch on the lights, you will be charged from there on. And the moment you switch off, it will not charge you. So how long you consume is also one of the factors that will affect your cost. Then maintenance. Whether you, you need to maintain your particular service, whether it's shutting down, like I said, OK, uh, uh, depending on uh, maintenance, whether you've shut it. But remember, the storage cost is still there because your VM is still existing on the data center of some region, right? The region that you select, it is still there. OK, so for maintaining that VM, Azure will definitely charge you. OK, so that will also affect the cost. It will affect your subscription, the amount in your subscription. You will see like, OK, today it was 11,000. Today it has come down. It has come to 10,000. So why is it charging you is because of the maintenance that it requires at the data center level. Even if you have shut down the VM, the storage cost or maintaining that VM, OK, uh, in case your VM, in, in case that data center goes down, it has to uh, do some redundancy. They provide you with the availability, right? So that's the cost it will take from you. OK, and it will require that maintenance cost. So th that is the third factor that will affect your cost. Then the region where you're deploying the region. OK, that will also matter. So you saw I was always selecting East US. 
I, I was not taking a region closer to me. OK, though I have an option for it. Why I was going for East US is because a VM when I create there is relatively cheaper compared to the Southeast Asia region or uh, Central India or South India region. OK, uh, it is relatively cheaper for me because I need to use the subscription for a month. OK, that I have. OK, I get uh, I'm an MCT, so whatever subscription I have, I need to use it for that period. OK. Uh, so the region also matters. OK. Apart from that, what kind of a data are you? Uh, are you putting any data into the uh, resource? Are you or are you giving uh, or you're sending out that data from that resource to some other place? So if you if the data is inbound, it is going to be free. Inbound transfers are free. But if you have to do an egress, OK, that is outbound data. Definitely you will be charged. OK, if you are going to send data across resources, you are going to be charged. So you have to pay for that. So the network traffic does matter. So like if you are communicating between two VMs, doing a file share between two VMs, the file you share from one VM to the other, that outbound data is going to be charged. So that can also affect your cost. It can increase your or decrease your cost. And then finally, what kind of a subscription you have? You have a free trial. Free trial does not allow you to explore lots of things. OK, like the DDoS, Firewall, or uh, for that matter, Microsoft Defender, all these services do not come into picture. OK, free trial has very little credits, around 200 credits you get, $200 of credits you get. OK, so the subscription also matters in this situation. And if you want to manage the cost associated to the subscription, you need to manage all the other factors. So these are six factors that affect cost. Then I told you all about marketplace in the morning where you can find all the services, all the app, third party applications, all your resources on to the Azure marketplace. So you can even purchase provision, whatever you want onto the marketplace. Now the pricing calculator, I told you you can manage your cost better if you want to estimate uh, before you create any resource. If you want to see how much it will charge you, you can do that. And for that, Microsoft or Azure has provided a service called as pricing calculator. So this calculator will actually help you predict costs OK, let's say what is the cost in East US region? What is the cost in Southeast Asia region? What are the different options? OK, you want to do basic configurations. That your is this is the service that you can use. So let me just quickly show you all how you can configure the cost. So if I come over here and I search price as your pricing calculator, go for the first option, the link. So you can see all the services that I talked about listed over here. OK, so you can just click on any of the service. and click on view over here. So now whatever configurations we did while we created a VM, OK, we can do it over here. OK, you can go for this. You can go for what kind of a, uh, optimization do you want? You can decide. You will have to know more about it. OK, then what is the instance? What is the uh, disk or uh, compute that you are using? So if I go for a DS, V DS series and you go for DS 12. OK, how much RAM ROM are you getting for? How long are you going to keep it on? OK, so if you want to know that if you have a hybrid license, like I told you, you have some resources deployed on the uh, on premise and and you want to deploy it on the cloud. If you have you need a license for that and if you have that license, you can uh, add that. It will definitely bring down the uh, cost. 
uh, pricing calculator and TCO are not the same. They are different. I'll talk about TCO in some time. OK, how much bandwidth it will charge you? Uh, how much bandwidth you will require? OK, how much data are you going to outbound daily or hourly, whatever you can put it here. If you have any disk okay, of your own, OK, you can add a snapshot over here of that. OK, if you go for a standard HDD, SSD, what kind of a disk you are going, whether it's an unmanaged disk, managed disk, you can see the cost over here. So you can see uh, I have a monthly cost of this much. I can change the uh, currency. I can make it to INR. So you can see monthly cost I will be incurring is this. OK, so you can have no upfront cost, correct? So if I have a hybrid benefit or if you have reserved this particular instance for a year, for three years, let's say you don't want this instance as of now, but probably after a year or three years or two years, OK, you can reserve it and keep it. Let's say this much. So you, you will get a discount of 13%. So you can see it has gone down. A little bit compared to earlier, OK? You can go for a three year instance as well. OK, so you are selecting monthly. You can go for that so you can see drastic change has occurred. OK, so it's up to you. You can reserve those instances as well. So if you go for this, you will get a much more uh, cheaper option. OK, you can go for the hybrid benefit. If you have hybrid benefit again, you can see the cost has gone down. OK, so this is how you can predict cost, not just for VMs, even for storage accounts. You can do that. OK, what kind of a storage account it is? It's a file, blob, data lake, what it is, what type of a purpose? I mean, what kind of a, a type it is? Is it Gen 2, Gen 1? OK, all of that, what kind of a access tier? OK, what kind of a capacity? Is it pay as you go or are you reserving it? What kind of a charge you are uh, you want to see what how much you will be built? You can predict the cost by coming to pricing calculator. OK. Then if you want to do a migration operation, like from your on-premise to, uh, to the cloud, you want to see how much will you be charged for it. OK, you can go for the TCO. Okay, it is something that will tell you, OK, if you are if you have some instances on the on-premise cloud or on private cloud, how much are you paying? But if you shift or migrate those services to the Azure cloud, how much will you pay? OK, so if you want to do a comparison of that, OK, it is possible using the TCO. That is the total cost of ownership calculator. OK, so let's just see how you can do that. So I'll just show it to you all. And come here, look for total cost of ownership calculator. Go on the first link. So here you determine what kind of a server do you have? That is a VM configuration. OK, then you can if you have any databases, add those databases. OK, then you add the storage. So I'm just keeping the basic configuration, right? Guys, it's up to you. You can change these configurations. OK, networking destination region. You can select whichever region you want. I'll go for East US if it's there. Yeah. OK, and click on next. Click on next. So here you can see how much you are paying if you have services on the on premise and how much you would pay if you are on Azure. So I'll just change this. Okay. 
So you get a complete analysis report. So you can see total cost that you are paying is of around $98,000. But if you go with Azure, you're saving so much cost on 55% on compute, 31% on storage. Okay, you get a total breakdown of it. Okay, how much will it charge for compute? How much are you paying as of now for compute? Okay, so if you want to do a comparison of that, okay, you can come to the ECO. So this is a complete report that you get. Okay, you can do the changes. You can go change your configuration, but keep in mind this is for migration purposes, if you're migrating from Azure, uh, sorry, from on-premise to Azure, okay, so how much cost you will have to incur and how much savings you will do, it's what is estimated. So you can see roughly $85,000 you will be saving. So this is what is the pricing calculator. And the total cost of ownership. Then there is a cost management service as available on Azure. Okay, uh, if you want to get report, uh, uh, you know, alerts that you you have exceeded your limits, get recommendations on costs. Okay, do get billing information, see where you have uh, uh, spent on which service you have spent more. Okay, or you want to set a budget, and within that budget, which services can you deploy? If you want to know, you can come to Azure cost management tool, okay? So for that, you can use this. Then this was about the cost management. Then there are certain governance and compliance offerings that Azure has. The very first is the Azure Blueprint. So Azure Blueprint is like, uh, like when we, um, you know, have, we have bought a new flat, Okay, and we want to do the interiors of the flat. So uh, the architect or the interior designer, he will ask you for the blueprint of your flat, right? Uh, how many BHK is your flat? How many? Where is the kitchen? Where is the hall? How many bedrooms are there? Is there an attached attach bathroom to that bedroom or not? So it gets a layout of that entire flat, correct? So if I want to give a layout, to the development team, okay, so that I can deploy any service, any environment on cloud as fast as possible, okay, I can create a Azure blueprint for that. So the blueprint will consist role assignments, which uh, sales department, what assignment I want to give, role I want to give, marketing, how much role I want to give, what role I want to give to my subscription, to my active directory, okay? I don't want it to be deployed in the Azure, in the Japan region. I want to set a policy. So I will give a blueprint of that. What ARM templates, how many resource groups I want to create, in which region should those uh, services be deployed? All that information, if I want to give under one template, I can use the Azure blueprint so it will be like the sketch of your azure okay and the development team will stick to it and create the resource according to that then you have azure policy like said if you want to con if you want to restrict some uh, or you know provide some standards okay so that no one can access or create any uh, services resources in a particular region or in a particular or not exceed the cost okay or something like that you can put a policy okay and if you apply it at the management group level automatically it will be taken or inherited by the subscription resource groups and the resources okay so you can uh, you have full liberty to decide whoever is the owner of that management group will have the full liberty if you are the owner of that group no worries you can uh, uh, apply any policy you want okay so if you don't have a policy to create resources in the Japan region, in Singapore region, because the cost is high. You can put a policy and you can do it through the Azure policy service. Then resource logs. At times, we are humans, right? We tend to make mistakes. 
correct? So if I want to uh, avoid mistakes, like an intern is trying to probably, you know, um, uh, you know, has by default, you know, by some mistake here, he or she has deleted the resource group. So all your hard work, all of that will be, um, you know, it can be applied at any level. Okay, you can apply it at subscription level, even at resource group level, you can apply it as your policy. I just gave an example. Okay, now coming to resource locks. Okay, so accidentally or by mistake, you know, the intern or a person or even you can delete the resource group. Right, it can happen. So if you don't want that to happen, okay, you can put in a lock to that resource group. Okay, so like if uh, to your house, okay, in order to prevent it from uh, from theft or from uh, uh, burglary, what do you do? You put a lock to your house, secure or seal your windows, ensure nobody can enter or go when you are not at home. Right. So similarly, if you want to prevent any uh, accidental deletion or modification in your resource group, you can put a lock to that. OK, I'll just quickly show you all how to do that. So there are two locks that you can apply. One is delete and the other is read only. In delete, you can read, update, but you cannot make or you cannot delete the resource group. OK, but in read only, you can just read whatever in, is inside the resource group. But if you do want to do any modification or you want to delete that resource group, that is not possible. OK, so these are the two types that are there. I will quickly show you all how to do it. I come to my resource group. Come to webinar. So if you see, scroll down here, you have an option of locks. Come over here. So I will add a lock. I say to cannot delete. Give it a name. And select this to be delete and click on OK. So now a delete lock has been applied. OK, come to the overview. Click on delete resource group. And now click on delete. So this will should give you an error that it cannot delete the resource group. Why? Because it has been locked. OK, so this is how you can apply a lock to your uh, resource group. So if you want to delete it, you can delete the lock as well. OK. So just delete it. OK, so there are ways in which you can interact with Azure. The one way I showed you all since morning is as your portal. You can use a portal. OK, it's like a UI, you, uh, UI interface. OK, apart from that, you have two command line tools. That is the PowerShell and um, uh, the locks will only be applied to the resource level. It cannot be applied to any other level. OK, if you don't want the resource group to be deleted, it can be only applied to the resource group, not to the resource. OK, it cannot be applied because when you create a resource by default, you have to give a resource group, correct? So if your resource group is locked, so the services under it or the resources under it will definitely be not deleted or tampered or modified. OK. Then there are two command line tools, PowerShell and CLI. OK, PowerShell, uh, keep in mind, this is a very common exam question that uh, if I have a Linux operating system and I'm trying to create a virtual machine through the PowerShell command line interface, through the PowerShell, can I create it? No, the answer is no. PowerShell is a, a command line interface only available on Windows operating system. If you want to use Linux or Mac OS, for that you can use uh, the Azure CLI. 
Okay, it's a very popular question. So guys, please keep this in mind. Then you have uh, ARM templates. You have the resource manager. From whom am I getting these resources? It is nothing but the Azure resource manager. From here, I can create, update, delete any resources within my subscription. Okay, so once I have authenticated myself, okay, I have authorized myself and I start now creating any resource. So this is the person who is re responsible to get those resources for you. Hello, ha ha. Okay. Then apart from this, you have templates. If you do not want to manually do things, you can write a JavaScript object notation, JSON files you can create. Okay. So, for example, if you have to create 100 VMs, it is insane to create the VMs in, in, uh, in the way I did in the morning. Just imagine 100 VMs you have to do in that way. It's not possible. So, it's, I mean, it, uh, you can use a template, you can define a template. OK, for in this region, you want 100 VMs of this size of this operating system. OK, and you will get 100 VMs created. So instead of manually going and doing it, you can just create a template like a blueprint. OK, and just define the number you want to. Um, just define the number. OK, and you can get that many VMs created. Then you have certain monitoring tools. OK, if you want to monitor any particular service in Azure, there are certain services given by Azure to you. OK, you want to monitor a VM, you want to monitor a database, you want recommendations, you can do that using these services. So one service is the Azure advisor, as the name says advisor. OK, you can it will give you recommendations, it will give you suggestions where you can save your cost, how you can improve your performance, where you can work on security, but just pertaining to the service, not the entire cloud. Keep that in mind. It's just pertaining to a VM, pertaining to a resource. OK. Yeah, this code is exportable. The code is exportable, the JSON code. Then you have service health. If any service is undergoing any maintenance, at the cloud side in a particular region, if that particular service is of not good health as of now, okay, uh, you will, uh, if you want to monitor that, you can come to Azure Service Health. It is a collection of these services which informs you how good is the service health, how well it is, is it experiencing any problem in a specific region? OK, how is the resource? Is it undergoing any maintenance or is the service going to be uh, discontinued? All that information comes in the service health category. And then finally, you have the Azure monitor service. So what is the monitor service? Monitor is is a service that gives you in depth. Uh, insight of your service okay like if you want to uh, do log analysis want to get uh, alerts okay that this is the problem this was the error that occurred okay you can do it through the azure monitor how much data was transferred where error occurred all that log analysis you want to get a dashboard for that just for a specific service then you can go for the azure monitor so if i show you for vm So in the morning, we had created a virtual machine. So if you come over here, scroll down to the monitoring tab, you can get the entire information. OK, all the information you can get started with the log analytics. OK, where was your disk maximum used, where it was not, where it was idle. OK, how much CPU was used. OK. The entire report will be given over here. OK, so this is the monitoring service. OK, so with this, we bring an end to module three. OK, any questions, guys, up till now? I'm sorry, I really went fast in the last section because we are running out of time. So if you want to know more, want to study, you can do that. 
okay uh, you can uh, uh, study on your own i just gave you an overview okay just quickly i went through all that okay so now coming to the exam prep session we will just do this quickly okay i will definitely share links for that okay so don't worry i will tell you all from where you can practice all of that just give me a couple of minutes okay so i will be doing some sample questions not many questions i have picked up just one or two from each module so just to tell you uh, what level of uh, questions will be coming okay then where can you register and some certain uh, reference links okay uh, as to how you can uh, from where you can prepare and all of that ppt i will not be able to share the ppt guys it is microsoft ppt so i will share the link from where i have picked up the ppt so don't worry just give me a couple of minutes i will uh, i will give all that information so coming to a sample question okay so this uh, first i will just explain the pattern to you all okay so az 900 is a very fundamental uh, uh, exam so don't worry no coding questions are going to come at all okay you're not supposed to write a code fill in the code nothing as such then secondly you are not going to get any uh, practical questions okay no practical questions are going to be asked you are not going to be asked to uh, demonstrate create a vm work create uh, put a resource log nothing as of now no uh, questions related to that you are going to get then it will be more of mcqs okay where multiple choice questions will be there wherein you have to uh, uh, select the appropriate choice okay not just one choice can come you will get a, you will get questions where you have to select multiple choices so for a question there can be two three uh, questions that can uh, uh, that can have that can be the correct answer okay so uh, apart from that you can get scenario based questions now what do i mean by scenario based uh, they will give you a scenario they will give you the problem and to that problem they will give you a solution so you have to tell whether this solution is appropriate or not whether it is applicable or not in the form of yes or no okay so something that you can see on the screen okay not just this but some more yes and no questions will be there so some scenario based case study based questions can come okay so this is the answer for this particular question so something like this can come then you can get match the following type questions okay wherein you have to there will be definition given and you have to match the columns accordingly so this is the correct answer for this then apart from that you can get you have to select multiple Quest, uh, answers like I told you. Okay, so this is like a scenario based question, and you have to, from the given options, you have to select the appropriate options. You can get a question like this as well. Okay, so you can see there's a scenario that they have given. Okay, and then they are expecting the output. So this is the answer. These are, this is the answer to the question. Then you can have one answer also. A question can have one answer to the uh, uh, to the question. So whatever is the appropriate answer, just uh, match that. So some more questions. So you can see you have to highlight two benefits. Okay. So the answer to there are two options to this answer. So these are the two options. Then something like this. Again, the same thing something like this again so you have to drag and drop okay and match the appropriate answer so this is like it then yes and no like i told you something like this again the same thing again sorry guys i'm just going through I'll tell you all from where you can uh, study. Okay. 
So the questions are almost the same. So you can see this is another yes and no. So I told you there's a situation. They have given a solution. There's a problem. There's a solution. And do you think it needs that the solution is appropriate for the problem or not? You have to mention it over here. OK, so some questions around that. Some more around to that. Okay, so if you have to register for the exam, okay, there is a site called as learn.microsoft.com. So just give me one minute. I'll delete, I want to delete this resource group since we no longer need it. So, guys, if you don't need a service and you want to judiciously, you know, or in a practical way or in a logical way, handle your uh, cost, so please keep on deleting any service that you create. I do that. Like I told you, I have limited subscription or I have limited amount that is there. So please keep on deleting all of that. Now I can come to a uh, website called as learn.microsoft.com. I will share this in the chat box as well. Okay, come to the first link. So if you want to avail the batch, you don't have to register. You have to register yourself on the portal, okay, on the Microsoft Learn portal, okay, in order to get it. So this is the site wherein you will get all the information that I talked about, okay. So if you come to uh, certifications, now certifications, come to AZ nine hundred. And click on the first link. So you can come here and schedule your exam. So Pearson View it has a tie up with Microsoft and they are offering the exam. So if you want to see how much it costs in general, so you can see the INR, which is around 3696. Okay, but since we are Microsoft Gold Partners, we get the exam vouchers at a discounted rate. Okay, so instead of 3696, you will have to pay 40% less. Okay, and you can take that voucher from us and give the exam. Okay, and uh, clear the exam. Apart from that, there is a free practice test that is available. So you can practice from here. Okay, all the questions related to um, what, what kind of questions can come in the uh, AZ 900 certification? You can see over here. Okay, practice this uh, particular, give this exam. Okay. Apart from that, you can have a, a sandbox kind of an environment also. So you can explore here. Okay, in what language you want, you can select. So you get a sandbox environment. So this is the actual environment, guys. This is how it will look like. Okay, this is the this is the environment of your micro of your exam that will be there. Okay, uh, if you go through Pearson View, okay, Pearson View. If you go and uh, do the certification, uh, give the certification exam. Keep in mind that uh, you have to uh, clear your area around you. OK, you can't have anyone disturbing you. You have to be in a room uh, solely for yourself. OK, and this exam is for what? One hour, 60 minutes, and you will ex you can expect some 40 questions, MCQ based questions. OK, no negative marking again. OK, and you can clear this exam. So if you scroll down, you can see three modules. These are the modules that we discussed today. OK, so if you want to study any module, you can come here, click on the start button and you can start studying all of this. Whatever I talked or I created the presentation were from this site. OK, so you can have you can go do an overview, study all of this. OK, and, um, and give the AZ 900 certification exam. So. This is the entire AZ 900 uh, training. 
Thank you so much, guys, for attending. Uh, yeah, and passing marks is 700 out of 1000. You need to get 700 marks in order to clear the certification of AZ 900. So, with this, I bring an end to today's training. Thank you so much for attending. Chaitali, if you have anything, you can go on. I think she is on hold. So, um, thank you so much, guys. Please do fill the feedback. If you have any questions, you can ask right now. I am available to answer them. Or you can uh, reach out to, uh, if you want the exam voucher, okay, uh, you can uh, contact Chaitali. She has dropped in her email ID in the chat box. You can contact her and the exam voucher. And if you want to, uh, if you want to know about our uh, advanced role-based certifications, please get in touch with Chaitali. She'll share you our calendar. Okay, if we have any program even related to uh, the any certification, okay, that we offer, you can definitely go and check with Chaitali. So thank you so much, guys. I had a wonderful day today, and I wish you all the best um, for the exam. Okay, and please do fill in the feedback, guys. It really will be very important for me. Okay, uh, and I wish all the best. I wish you all all the best. Thank you. If you have filled in the feedback form, redeem the badge. You can please leave the session. Do we need credits to access the learning material? No, you don't need any credits. It's absolutely free. You just have to create your account on the portal. Okay, and you can, uh, if you have to, yeah. And one more thing I forgot, guys, if you want to create a free account. Okay, so you can, I'll just share the link in the chat box. So you can get one month of free access to the Azure portal. So, but you will need a credit card, guys. You will uh, have, you will have a, you need to have a credit card or a debit card. I think credit debit card no longer works. Okay, but you will have to uh, have a credit card in order to create an account on the Azure portal. What is the use of badges that we have received? Guys, you can put it on LinkedIn. Trust me, the moment you uh, put it on LinkedIn, lots and lots of people will ask you about, you know, cloud and all of that. It will enhance your profile. Okay, you can share it with your people on um, LinkedIn. Okay, it will help recruiters. Uh, get you know you'll get attract i mean lots and lots of people will come to your website and into your uh, linkedin profile and see so it's a fantastic way to put it on linkedin okay uh, lots and lots of people can come and see it uh, validity these badges that we have shared it has no validity uh, and if you clear the az900 certification uh, that also has no uh, expiry OK, uh, you can the basic fundamental certifications uh, do not do not expire. OK, so once you clear AZ 900, you are certified AZ 900. Uh, you are you have knowledge on AZ 900. So links I showed you the practice practice tests do this uh, a particular uh, learn paths okay the link i have shared above and also there is one more site called as exam topics which has the exam dumps okay uh, from where i have picked up some some questions as well so exam topics is the name but you will have to buy the subscription in order to access their dumps okay so that is one site you can refer to 
if you want to uh, work with uh, or you want to clear the certification. So thank you guys. All the best and uh, please, if you haven't given any feedback, please do fill in the feedback form and then leave. Okay. Uh, thank you. And if you want any updates, Chaitali is the correct person to address to. Okay. So if you have done filling the feedback, uh, uh, exam dump link. Okay. I'll share that. You can just mention the site. You can just go and see it's a popular website. Okay. And you can just use that. So thank you guys. Please, you can leave uh, the session if you are done using or uh, creating, uh, I mean, fill in the feedback form, uh, redeeming your batch. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. See you.